Amen. Good morning, and welcome to Pleasant Retreat United Methodist Church, uh, our online worship today. Um, I want to give a few words, uh, just uh, welcome to each of you, and let you know that we do appreciate you connecting with us online, especially now. Um, in this past week, we just had so many things going on in our world, but also here in our local church. Um, we had uh, some occasions where it seems that the numbers of members that have been uh, affected uh, by the coronavirus, as well as the two staff people, um, have just put us in a position where to do no harm, our best option was to take some weeks that we would not do online, uh, we would not do in-person worship, and we'll just go to this one online worship experience. Um, it's not our preference but it's a way to help protect and care for us. So uh, please be understanding and kind about that and uh, knowledgeable of the fact that we don't take these decisions uh, lightly. But in the best interest of our members and those that need to heal and recover, uh, this next three weeks will give us a chance to get everybody well is my prayer. Um, a special thoughts today going to all those in our church family that are uh, feeling the after effects, going through the process of um, their um, isolation and uh, dealing with uh, taking on the, the virus itself. Um, and um, we just ask that we as a church could be a support and care for you in our prayers and our presence as best we can. Um, again, if you're among those or you know people in this situation and they have a special need, need someone to run to the store for them, someone to do things, deliver things to them at home uh, where they're quarantined, we'd be glad to respond as a church and uh, care for those needs and just make us aware. Um, if you're having um, some issues with staying with us, I want you to know as far as the staying online, what we do is we have a website where you can go to there and you could uh, connect uh, to our we church website and there's a place there where you could subscribe or unsubscribe to be a part of our conversations as a church. And that's the way that we use for our mass communications that we need to do. And in this case, this week, we sent word out to everybody that was on that email list. If you're not, then I pray that maybe you will add your name to that list so Lindsay will have it. Um, and then at the same time, um, to our Facebook group page, that's where you can actually watch these services online. If you're not a member of our Facebook group, then what you need to do is just to ask to join, and then there's two questions that you need to answer. You do that, and then we'll monitor that and make sure you get added to it. If you're a member in our church family that's in our Facebook group, please know that you can click on uh, setting up a watch party. Uh, that option will let you then host it on your page and or your timeline, and then it lets your friends and circle, even though they're not in our group, have access to watch this service with you. Um, that's the way that we can extend our reach and do it in a way that we don't get people who come on and harvest um, email addresses and sell Ray-Ban sunglasses. Uh, we're glad that, again, we can have all these means of God's grace in a digital world, a digital age, to still do our worship together. I want you to know that uh, the next few weeks we'll be working to bring in our praise team, do other things to, to make this more flexible. But for today, we've worked in a short window of getting things done. And uh, I pray that God will use today's service to bless your heart, to give you a pathway for having the worship that we all need, especially in our current time and space. Um, I want to ask you to do some things in your part of this worship service, though, as well. Uh, if you're at home there, I'm going to ask you to do some things for me. I need you to get a candle that you can light when I light the altar candles and have as your Christ candle uh, a chance to engage worship there where you are. Secondly, today, because we're doing a remembrance of baptism experience, I'm going to ask you to have a bowl with some fresh water. And I'll let you go ahead and be working on that and get that ready where you're ready whenever we are uh, to follow through in that service experience. But I also had another thought this morning. I just kind of got tickled about this to myself a little bit. I thought, you know, one of the things, we don't, we don't have fun near enough some days. And life gets us so filled with all these things that we have to do. And the news, everything else around us, we just feel like we're at a loss. And we forget how to laugh and to have fun. Uh, I'm going to issue a challenge to you. And, and please keep it, uh, keep it appropriate for church, if you will. But um, if you're willing and able and you want to, uh, why don't you share this morning as well as you're checking in online, share where you're watching from, uh, either home in your living room, designate what room you're in, and tell us what you're wearing for worship today. 
because I'm curious. I'm having a feeling that there's some people out there that are very comfortable right now, and I had to dress up this morning, but that's what made me start thinking about this. And I know already, Otis, I already know you got hospital gown on the list there, so you get that one. But if any of you others are in the hospital gown, I want to know about that too. I pray that you'll just have fun with this a little bit too, and that we'll engage it in a way that realize that God can come to all experiences of our life. He can find us wherever we are. When we tune into Him, He is tuned into us and ready and available. You don't have to dress up. You don't have to impress Him. You don't have to do anything but be available in your heart and your spirit. And, and that's what I'm hoping you'll do right now in this moment. So get your Christ candle, get your bowl of uh, clean water ready, and... Um, Share with your church family um, how you're prepared and receiving God today. I'm going to light our altar candles and let this be a time in which we welcome God's spirit and presence with us. And we have the light of Christ in our hearts and lives. We celebrate that. Last week, we shared in our Epiphany Sunday the moments in which the, um, the eyes of those who were with Jesus recognized the gift. Have you recognized the gift you have today in Christ in your midst? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that you have walked with us in this entire journey. At no point have you been a distant God who has left us to the vices. You instead experience with us and you pursue us and share with us the ways that we can conquer these things that are surrounding us right now and overcoming us. I pray for the hearts of every person who is experiencing this worship today, whether it's a church family member or whether it's a guest of our family. I pray, God, that we'll feel that connection as one. Make us one in spirit and one in our worship this day. Prepare our hearts now to receive you, but also to engage you, to give you the praise that you are worthy of. It's in Christ Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. And so as we do our worship today, I have some big shoes to fill, as you may have heard. Um, Otis Naren, one of our staff members, is one of the ones that's been uh, um, battling this disease, and we pray that he's getting some much-needed rest. But i got to fill his shoes there this week as well. Uh, next week, I hope that maybe we'll have Sally, a professional, uh, be here to sing with you. But today you have me. And I want to ask you to help me in our singing there. Uh, you have the words, hopefully, that you printed off of our uh, Facebook group page or you found in your email, and that'll let you sing and join with us there where you are. Or if not, then you can probably know some of these words today. Um, but I'm going to ask you to sing out loud. Don't just sit there and stare. Uh, be a part of the worship and engage it uh, wherever you are. <sighs> I stop and I think about it, guys. This has been one of those weeks that the world has just been all over the place, has it not? And we're feeling overwhelmed right now. I've been sharing with other pastors. There's a lot of them that are looking for what they're going to preach today. And they, they're trying to find that word that we need. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, the gospel is relevant to every experience of our life. And there's not a whole lot I have to do other than just share the gospel. And the truth is, the church has a message which needs to be heard today. And what better time do we have than now to share with a world that's feeling so anxious that there is this assurance that God can bring us. And there's this assurance that we have as the body of Christ that through it all, no matter what, God will be uh, the one that will lead us through. And so I'm going to invite you to sing a song of faith with me. Um, and you can stand where you are if you want to. But this song is one you probably know. Let's sing about God's blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above, 
Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You can't sing that song sitting down. You've got to stand for it. But that is the message, that we have a story that we can share and be a part of with God and with our world. And so there's a blessed assurance that God brings. We also express this in our call to worship today as we witness again the ways that we are in one place, but God comes to where we are. Will you join me in this call to worship? Lost, wandering without purpose, with we wander lost, but the God, the God descends like a dove upon us. We hear the ancient words that name and claim us as children of God. We are cleansed, refreshed, and made new in the love of these words. Amen. And as Christians who find that faith, we then find that means of God's grace that brings us together to make those statements of faith that we hold to. You grew up listening to this probably, but think again about what these words say about the comprehensive, comprehensive way that God speaks to us in our faith. Let's share together our, our affirmation of faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated if you've been standing at this point. And I want you to join me again in a word of song that helps us welcome again the Spirit of God that would be among us. You know, there's a joy we have in that when we're gathered as God's people, God comes and brings to us exactly what we need. Let's sing together. on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what Thou dost love, and do what Thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until with thee I will one will to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am holy thine. Until this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Mm -hmm. 
Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. We're grateful this morning also for Brandy Cheeks, who is filling the shoes of Johnny. And Johnny also has been one that we've been praying for. And she and her husband, David, both have uh, uh, been uh, tested positive for the virus. And they've been undergoing some care and nurture as well. And in my conversations with her, they're doing well, but um, they need continued prayers at home. Um, remember Otis again also. Hopefully he'll go home today or tomorrow. Um, and then we're mindful of the other families that have been going through this process and are still going through this process right now. You know, as a church family, we have that sacred relationship with God that also becomes a sacred relationship with us as a community. And one of the things we're called to do is to pray for one another. And I'm going to invite you to join me in a time of pastoral prayer where you would join me in praying for the community of our church, but also the larger community around us. Um, our world certainly needs some care right now. Uh, we've become a people that are so focused in different places and so divided on certain issues that we've forgotten the ways that we're actually bonded um, in life and in our relationship with God. And so I invite you to pray for the hearts, the spirits of those who lead our nation as well as those who set the tone for our nation and from the places where we would be needing him the most that we would find him in the days ahead. It begins, though, in our hearts, does it not? And so join me in our hearts and in our spirit as we pray together. Father God, I thank you for a nearness that we find in you, not even with the words, but in the ways that we pause and give ourselves to you. That's what worship is about. That's what this time of prayer is for. And that's where we find you is in the midst of our life itself, wherever we are. I thank you for the reach of your love and grace this morning that is not limited by walls or space, that it reaches to the very places that we would put ourselves before you. And as we each in our worship this day have lit the light of Christ, we have acknowledged your nearness, but I pray, God, that we'll be as vulnerable with you as you are with us. And so as you reveal to us your word and your spirit and give us direction for our life, I pray that we too will reveal to you and to ourselves the ways that we're a people in need of you. Yes, Lord, we have been blessed. We have, we have missed so many blessings this week because the news and everything around us has drawn us to the negatives. But life has gone on and we have witnessed it in ourselves and in our world, but we have not always identified the places that we see you the most. And I thank you for the smiles. I thank you for the acts of kindness. I thank you for the nurses, the doctors. I pray for all those, Lord, who are your hands of mercy right now especially. I pray for those, Lord, who are becoming the hands and the feet of Christ in the places that it's needed the most and the voice of reason where it's needed the most, that they would speak your truth. And Lord, let us become a people that would be more focused again on where you are and the rich blessings of your love that are far beyond our deserving. And who are we, God, to demand from you that we could be loved when we have not yet learned to love one another nor to love ourselves? And I pray, God, that you'll bring us to a place that we can work on that today and work on that each day to become better at it. For when we see ourselves and our neighbor through your eyes, then we see what's worthy, we see what's redeemable, we see what's possible, and we have our vision again. Lord, I pray for all of us who are paralyzed with fear, that you'll walk us to the place that faith will speak again and give us a hope and an assurance of where we are going next. Today, we invoke your spirit and ask God that you heal us in body and in spirit. I pray for those who are struggling to breathe. I pray for those who are struggling to have that energy back. I pray for those who are feeling um, uh, a sadness about uh, the life and the world that they live. 
that you would give us again that cause to see that you are at work and that good things are made possible through Christ alone. For with Christ all things are possible is the way that Paul shared it with us. But also Paul also shared with us, God, that it was while we were yet sinners that you gave your son Jesus Christ for us. We didn't wait for that moment that we earned it, but instead we were vulnerable enough to receive it. And God, I pray that's the spirit today, that in this prayer we'll find the means of your grace that lets us pray not just with words heaped up, but in a spirit that takes us to a place that we suddenly find that we have a power, we have an ability with this prayer to make a difference. And I pray for those that need your healing, and I pray for those that need your strength, and I pray for those that need your hope this day. Give us the confidence that Jesus had, Lord. When the disciples came to him and asked him to show them to pray, he, he delivered not only in words and spirit, but with a confidence the ways that we can speak before our God. And I think of those words today and how he must have delivered them then with conviction in his heart. And so in the same spirit, we pray now. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, thank you for that time of prayer and that time of sharing. Um, I can't hear you, but I know the singing has been great today. And I'm betting that some of you are even amazed at each other a little bit, uh, how you can sing. But I want to share with you the words of Scripture that will speak to our day today. And we're going to draw from the Gospel of Mark, and we're going to hear words that he wants to share with us this day. You remember we last week had Jesus as the infant child that the wise men experienced. Today we experience the fully grown Jesus um, in the threshold of his life and ministry and with its beginning. And so we come to these words that Mark would share with us. Sorry. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong on his sandals, yet I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, He saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it's a challenge in some ways to make that jump to this experience. But... None of the authors of our Gospels are writing in a way that they want to give us a full historical account. They're writing in a way that they're sharing the glimpses into the Gospel message, the relevance of Jesus, and the declaration of what his life would mean for us, God's love. And they're doing it from different perspectives. And we've shared from Luke uh, two weeks ago. We shared from Matthew now. And now we're moving to Mark. And you can see the distinctions of the different gospel writers. Mark in particular here gives us some highlights to this passage that are important for us. 
what he's going to do is give us an understanding of how this experience that Jesus was going through was one that became a, a threshold of where the ministry began in his life. Yes, God uh, had, had already declared before his birth, and in the actual birth and in the, the testimonies at the temple when he was named, all the way to the wise men and the shepherds who have visited and now declared, we have heard who he is. But what Messiah means begins with this passage. And so we already see some issues that we hold to right now because today is our, we declare it on our church uh, Christian calendar as a baptism Sunday. And um, we have a lot of discrepancies about what we mean by baptism. I've shared with you before, but I, I want to repeat it now that we could argue all day long, for instance, about how much water it takes for a baptism and what age you get baptized and what that baptism specifically means. And the truth is, is that we do have a struggle at times when we talk about Jesus uh, being baptized because what happens then is that we have this question of where's the repentance for Jesus um, because he's sinless. And, did he, it didn't, and how did he get baptized? All we know from this scripture is that it was in the River Jordan that John baptized him. And then there's these words that follow up on that that says, when Jesus came up out of the water... And we're not sure what that means. Now, truth is, we can debate that too. Matter of fact, a group of pastors once got together from different denominations, and they started a conversation, and there was this heated conversation between two in particular, a Methodist pastor and another pastor. And the Methodist pastor was saying, okay, let's just get to the point here. The point is, is that you're saying that if I don't go all the way under the water, then I'm not baptized. And the other pastor said, correct. So, well, let's break it down some more. So if I go into the water and I go up, let's say I wade into the water up to my knees, am I baptized? The other pastor said no. Well, if I wade a little further and the water comes up to my waist, let's say, am I baptized yet? And the pastor said no. All right, I'm going to go deeper in the water. The water's up to my chin now. All you see is my head above the water. Am I baptized? And the other pastor said absolutely not. Okay, I'm going to go even deeper. I'm holding my breath now. The water is now at the very crest of my head, but my, the top of my head is still showing. Am I baptized? And the other pastor said, no, no. And then the Methodist pastor said, see, that's the part that counts right there. That part that we put the water on in the Methodist church. Yeah, we could argue this all day long. And there's not necessarily a right or wrong when it comes to the water, or how much water, and all of that. But when we discern what the message of baptism is, Mark gives us a path that we can see that something greater than just water over us is taking place. He even makes a distinction between the baptism of John and the baptism that Jesus is about. Did you catch it? There was a point here when, when John says, I baptize you with water, but I baptize you for repentance. In other words, when John was performing baptism, he actually would say the words, repent. And then he would immerse, or he would use, as some historians say, he used a large shell and poured the water over people. But he wanted you to know that God's grace was being poured on you, or you're being buried and raising again to this life, this new life that God wants you to have. Your repentance is the pathway to your baptism. It's called a believer's baptism. And so we don't deny that, but, in we, but when we take this understanding in this passage from Mark, what we see is that, that John himself says, I baptize you with water, but there was one coming after me, referring to Jesus, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, water is really just a symbol here. And so what we understand then is that this whole argument of how much water and all of that is not the main point of this passage. As a matter of fact, there's another thing I want to reveal to us today, and it's this. With John and the, and the, and the bringing and understanding of a repentance baptism, who is the main actor in that activity? Who is the one that can bring about that baptism? It's the repentant heart. It's you and me. That kind of baptism, that believer's baptism, happens when my heart is ready to turn to God, repent, turn around. 
And so a believer's baptism is based on me doing something. God has done what God is going to do. He's created the pathway of salvation, and I have to accept it. I have to repent and be baptized. But there's another baptism that's being revealed here in this passage that kind of accompanies this as well. It makes the whole picture for us. Because what Jesus does is Jesus comes as one who is um, unblemished. He is coming as one who has no reason to repent. And he asked John to baptize. You remember in the other passages, we see the hesitation in John. You're asking me to baptize you? And Jesus responds by saying to him, this is to fulfill what the prophets have already said. It's to make the completion You've done your part, but this is another part that must happen. And so John baptizes Jesus. And what we see in this passage then is that baptism has another element to it that we haven't experienced until Jesus comes. And it's this. When Jesus comes up out of the water, Mark tells us, then the heavens are opened and the voice of God responds. This is my son. This is my son. There's a naming, a declaration of relationship to God that's made by God himself. And if we really want to understand the fullness of what baptism means, what we have to understand is that if you're at an age of accountability, and if you're not in an age of accountability, there's another path of this, but if you're at an age of accountability, your baptism has to have two elements to it, and that's the actions of you and the actions of God. It can't be one way. And I love the fact that Mark paints this picture for us of how God is acting. You'll see this paralleled in some of the other gospel writers. But what we do is we have Mark making a clear distinction. John's baptism was one of repentance, but the one with Jesus involves and invokes the Holy Spirit. And he descends like a dove. And this is my son. This is my child. What I love about this is that when I remember my baptism and you remember your baptism, you need to know what age you were is not the critical point. But if you're at an age today, you need to be working to try to bring yourself to where both pieces of this story are coming together. That you do have that repentant heart that has some way responded to and been met with the action of God, which happens in a larger picture than just this baptism. God pouring out his spirit upon us. You know, when Jesus comes up out of the water and we see this action of God, it's the very thing that we declare, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, it's just a made a bold statement to our world. This is not the first time that God has declared Jesus to be his son. It's already spoken in the prophecies to Mary. You will give birth to your son, and he will become the Messiah. There's already this declared relationship even then. But in this moment, Jesus has come forward and helped us to see that our actions of repentance will always be met by an action of God where we will feel and experience in the fullness that God has named and claimed every one of us. You are a child of God. I want you to do something for me. Say your first name out loud, and then let's just change your last name to child of God. Richard, child of God. And what happens in that is that I find myself in a place that I realize that when I really put an emphasis on the relationship I have with God, then I'm going to fully understand what this baptism means. When we baptize children in the United Methodist Church, one of the things that we do is we we baptize with the first name and we leave off the last name because for that moment we are experiencing and witnessing the fact that that this truly is a child of God. Yes, they're not yet to the point that they're ready for that baptism of John with repentance, but they're yet in a place where God is uh, relentless in the fact that he has loved this child from the very beginning. And we're just simply making a, a public declaration. 
Richard, I baptize you in the name of the Father, then the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the witnesses to that then take on the responsibility, child of God.